Welcome to Cinematic Excrement and my ongoing quest to torture myself by watching, or in this case, re-watching, every Razzie Worst Picture winner. And now I find myself in the year 2011, which means... <sighs> Jack and Jill. Where were you? Oh God, that voice. How many times must I hear Adam Sandler speaking in an annoying voice? At least once more, apparently. I really don't mean to keep bagging on the Sandman. He is legitimately a good actor. Anyone who saw Uncut Gems will vouch for that. And even nowadays, he can be funny. Anyone who saw his Netflix stand-up special will vouch for that. I really want to like the guy, but sometimes he just makes it so difficult. Anyway, I first reviewed Jack and Jill almost 10 years ago, shortly after it became the first movie to sweep the Razzies, winning all 10 awards that were given out that night. And I'm pretty sure the only reason it won every award was so the Razzies could say it won every award. I mean, at least two of the awards are suspect as hell. Al Pacino absolutely did not deserve Worst Supporting Actor. Hell, I'm not sure if any of the nominees in that category deserved it. And Nick Swartzen was one of the nominees. And there's the award for Worst Prequel, Remake, Ripoff, or Sequel, which Jack and Jill won by being, according to the Razzies, a remake of Ed Wood's Glen or Glenda. I mean, come on. I said in my original review that this award was a bit of a stretch. I hereby retract that statement. It's not a stretch at all. It's just straight up bullshit. Literally the only thing Jack and Jill has in common with Glenn or Glenda is they both feature the lead actor in drag. You easily could have said this was a remake of Mrs. Doubtfire, or To Wong Fu, or Tootsie, or the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and it would have made just as much sense, you creatively bankrupt sons of bitches. Well, Jack and Jill is widely considered one of the worst movies ever made, and not without reason. It seems like this was made purely because Sandler thought it would be funny if he played a woman, and that's where the creative process stopped. The story is not the least bit interesting. Sandler's Jill character is annoying as hell and also a pretty terrible person, making it nearly impossible to sympathize with her even when the movie clearly wants the audience to do so. The jokes are repetitive as hell and rarely funny, and really, that's the biggest sin a movie like this can commit. You're a comedy. Your sole purpose is to be funny. Damn it, Sandler, you had one job! But if you saw my original review, you already heard me say all of that, and you don't need to hear me say it again. I need to tell you something new, something I didn't say the first time around. Well, for starters, there was one mistake that I did not catch in my first review, and for the life of me, I don't know how I missed this. After Jack and his family, including Jill, embark on their European cruise, Jack places a call to Al Pacino at the appointed time of 5.30. But an angry Pacino informs Jack that he meant 5.30 in LA, and it's actually 9.30 there because of the four hour time difference. Some of you may have already caught the problem here. If Jack is on a boat headed to Europe, then he must be somewhere in the Atlantic. Now, putting aside the unlikelihood of getting a cell phone signal in the middle of the goddamn ocean, if he's four hours away from LA, then 5.30 his time is 1.30 Pacino's time. You got the time change backwards, you jackass. What makes this especially baffling is there's a scene earlier in the movie where they make fun of Jill for not understanding how time zones work, as she booked a red-eye flight from New York to LA in an attempt to avoid jet lag. She never listens. She gains three hours. Every year she acts like she's flying to New Zealand. So at some point in the filmmaking process, they understood how time zones work. But then they just... forgot? How does that even happen? So that's one thing I didn't mention in my initial review. Second... I suppose I could give them a little credit for the visual effects. Oh, you mean like when they had both twins on screen at the same time? Exactly. Yeah, I suppose they did a good job with that. Wait, what the fuck? Ooh. Okay. That was weird, but, uh, I think we're back. Or I'm back, rather. Me. Just me. Just the one of me. Uh, yeah. Not sure what happened there, unless one of my neighbors has been messing with the laws of space and time again, and I've warned him about that, and I'm gonna file a complaint with the HOA because that is clearly against the bylaws, but never mind that now. 
Uh, where were we? Oh yeah, I was talking about things that I did not already discuss in my initial review of Jack and Jill. We covered the time zones and the twin effects, and let's not talk about that again. Uh, but anyway, that's two things. Now let's get on to the third thing. Yes, the third thing. The third thing. Uh, the third thing that I have not talked about already when I did my initial review of Jack and Jill, and now I'm going to talk about it now in the second look. Yes, that is the plan it is. The third thing meaning number three on the list. Three comes before four, after two. Five is right out. <laughs> Screw me, is that really it? Yeah, we may have run into a problem here. Normally, with these second looks, I have at least something of value to add, but in the case of Jack and Jill, I'm kinda stuck. I went back and rewatched the entire movie and my original review, which is often a painful process. Maybe I'm just being too hard on myself. But rewatching those old reviews has shown me just how bad I was at putting unnecessarily long pauses between sentences. Kind of like this. Why any of you early subscribers kept watching after all these years, I will never know. But yeah, apart from the bit about time zones and the surprisingly decent twin effects, there's really not much I can add. I can't even do my usual thing where I compare the movie to the other Worst Picture nominees that year because, believe it or not, I even did that in my original review. If you want the short version, yes, Jack and Jill was the worst movie of the year, but Bucky Larson was a very close second. I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, and all points in between. I'm sure you were hoping this video was going to keep you on the toilet a little longer, but... I got nothing. I already covered everything wrong with Jack and Jill in excruciating detail, and believe me, those details were excruciating, and there's really nothing left for me to talk about. Except... Something's brewing at D&D. Wow! Al Pacino! It's not Al anymore! It's Dunk! Dunkachino? Don't mind if I do! Yes, of course, the infamous Dunkachino commercial starring Al Pacino. Wow. Where do I even begin with this? Well, I guess I should begin at the beginning. If you haven't seen the movie or my initial review, the plot of Jack and Jill revolves around Jack, an advertising executive, trying to put together a commercial for Dunkin' Donuts' new cappuccino-inspired drink, the Dunkachino. But Dunkin' Donuts would only agree to work with Jack's company if they can get Al Pacino for the commercial, because his name rhymes with Dunkachino. Somehow, Al ends up falling in love with Jill, just go with it, so Jack tries to use his sister to get to Al, which doesn't go well because she can't stand him. This leads to a lot of bickering between the two and some very awkward situations with Al and both twins, but in the end, he agrees to do the commercial, which we finally get to see at the end of the movie, along with Pacino's reaction to the finished product. Product. Burn this. I'm sorry? This must never be seen by anyone. Coincidentally, critics said the same thing about the movie. There's some other stuff, like Jack finally mending his relationship with Jill, and a romance between Jill and Jack's gardener Felipe, played by Eugenio Derbez, but really, this is all an afterthought. The Dunkachino is the point of the movie. It was indeed a real drink Dunkin' Donuts introduced in 2011, and they worked with Happy Madison to promote it, so the movie itself is basically a 90-minute commercial. And once you learn that, it all starts to make sense. Of course the plot was half-assed. The plot never mattered. All that mattered was making that sweet Dunkin' Donuts money. By the way, the Dunkachino still exists in some parts of the world, but I think they discontinued it in the States. The commercial, however, lives on in infamy. And I never would have called that one. When I initially reviewed this movie, I basically acknowledged Dunkachino's existence as the movie's punchline, and that was it. The movie was seen as yet another trash fire in a long string of Adam Sandler blunders, and society basically moved on. 
until a few years ago when it suddenly became an internet meme. Somehow, years after we all blocked out Jack and Jill from our collective memories, everyone was talking about Dunkachino. They couldn't get enough of that Dunkachino. It started out small, a YouTube video here, a Reddit post there, not a lot, but more than you'd expect from a mostly forgotten movie. But things really took off when YouTuber Salty DK Dan started the Daily Dunkachino Twitter account and began uploading his own weird edits and remixes of the Dunkachino ad and later he opened it up to fan submissions. And what should have been a silly gag in a subpar movie was now a viral sensation. People are still talking about Dunkachino. The Get Played podcast, which is a great show that you should all be listening to, even mentioned it during their recent review of Adam Sandler's Pixels, which is a terrible movie that you should not be watching. Sandy Wexler made me laugh. Can Wait, I? Wexler's, is, Wexler's got Heather, some good jokes in it. is that the one that you love that one sequence from? Mm, uh, what, huh? What, no, you're wait. thinking of, um, I know you're thinking of, it's uh, Jack and Jill with Jack Dunkachino. And Jill, yeah. That's what you're thinking, Dunk I think. Dunkachino. Great sequence. Yeah. That's really good. I have a... Yeah. I have, <laughs> Can we just play that now? Just put that yeah, in the podcast. Yeah, let's play it. Let's okay. play it. Let's play it. Please. <laughs> I, we live in a just world because you can just type in Dunkachino and it's the first thing that comes up. Yes, it should. Anyway, some of the stuff on Daily Dunkachino is absolutely insane in the best possible ways. Salty and his fellow controllers contributors got really creative with some of these. There are a ton of clever audio remixes, but a lot of them went nuts with the visuals too. Some are made to look like video games, like DDR, Metal Gear Solid, or Ace Attorney. One was made using Lego figurines. One was made to look like a sitcom. One uses that scene from Interstellar. There's a JoJo video, because of course there's a JoJo video. There's even one that looks like a reconstructed Lost Doctor Who episode, with the actual Peter Purvez reprising his role as Steven Taylor. How did they pull that off? And and that's just a small sample. There are like 400 of these fucking videos. I could go on all day singing the praises of the Daily Dunkachino. All this from one scene in a decade-old crappy Adam Sandler flick. And it's not like there's a horde of Jack and Jill fans out there that brought this meme to life. This isn't one of those movies that's undergone a critical re-evaluation in recent years. Oh no, 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 no. It still sucks. In fact, I'm willing to bet a good number of Dunkachino fans have never even seen Jack and Jill. Some of them may not even know it's from Jack and Jill. And honestly, they're probably better off for it. So how did we all become so infatuated with the dunka 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 chino? Well, allow me to offer my own bullshit analysis. For starters, it's easily the best part of the movie. I mean, yes, it's a terrible commercial, but unlike the rest of the movie, it's terrible on purpose. That's the joke. Jack wasted all of this time and effort and nearly destroyed his family in the process just to get Al to film this commercial. And it turned out so bad that Al immediately rejected it. All copies. Destroy them. I'm sorry, Mr. Pacino, but we must preserve this for the good of humanity. We can destroy the rest of the movie, though. That's fine. Most of Jack and Jill is just so lazy. The Jewish jokes, the Mexican jokes, the ugly woman jokes, the jokes about Jill's incompetence. They scraped the bottom of that barrel so much they wore a hole through to the floor. But Don Cuccino is the exception. This is the one scene where they actually put in some honest-to-God effort. Every single person involved here is giving 110%, including and especially Mr. Al Pacino. It's not Al anymore. It's Dunk. I love how enthusiastically he says dunk. It's loud enough to echo throughout the soundstage. The music, the dancing, the editing, the references to Pacino's movies. Say hello to my chocolate blend. It's all terrible, but it's expertly terrible. If that makes sense. And it's actually funny. Plus, it features Pacino doing something you would never expect him to do. I've said before that I love when celebrities are willing to make fools of themselves on camera, and this is no exception. He is great in this. And who knew he was such a good dancer? How could the Razzie voters have watched this scene and given him worse supporting actor? How, I ask you? I think the answer is obvious. They have no souls. Hey, it's the only explanation that makes sense. Well, I can't believe I'm doing this twice in a row, but again, I find myself saying thank you to the person responsible for the subject of today's review. Mr. Sandler, your movie may have sucked overall and given us a fair bit of nightmare fuel, but you did give us the greatness that is Don Cuccino and the hours of entertainment and creativity that ensued. 
And for that, I say thank you. And thank you to Salty and his fans for facilitating this madness. You have all done the Lord's work. If you haven't seen Jack and Jill, boy howdy do I not recommend it. But if you haven't seen Dunkachino, you must. It is truly a work of art. But I take no responsibility should you fall down a rabbit hole of memes afterwards. You have been warned. Well, let's never speak of Jack and Jill again. Next time we move to the year 2012, which means it is, in fact, that time again. <laughs> Remarkable! Something's brewing at DNA. <laughs>